Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we got a great webinar with uh, Dr. Andreas Tolius today. And uh, also, our own Dr. Rio Vetter is going to be uh, um, as, as answering his questions and uh, helping out. So, uh, we're going to have a lively QA. So, get your questions ready. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. And just a reminder next week, September, or two weeks, September 3rd, we're going to be continuing our webinar uh, series with, uh, we're going to do some uh, frequently asked questions, uh, having some open discussions. We're going to have some of our application scientists and salespeople here. Um, so it's a great time to ask any questions you might have about it, uh, any of our products. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rio to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Dr. Tolius. Thanks, Rio. Hey, good morning, everyone. As Matt mentioned, we have a, a special treat this morning. And our guest, Andreas, Dr. Andreas Tolius, who is currently a professor and endowed chair in the Department of Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Tolius' research is focused on understanding how brains give rise to intelligence. His lab combines imaging, electrophysiological, molecular, and behavioral methods with machine learning approaches to decipher the neocortical circuit principles of perceptual interference. Dr. Tolius obtained his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Systems and Computational Neuroscience and postdoctoral training, training at the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybernetics. He has received numerous awards, including the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, the Beckman Foundation Young Investigator Award, the McKnight Foundation Scholar Award, and the Michael E. DeBacke Excellence in Research Award. Dr. Tolius is also a co-founder of the Neuroscience Inspired Networks for Artificial Intelligence Organization and is a leading an international team and is leading an international team of scientists and engineers working on the interface between brain research and machine intelligence with the goal of engineering less artificial and more intelligent algorithms. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Tolius. Uh, hi, thanks, uh, Rio. Just share my screen. Um, so everybody can see my screen, I guess. Um, so is this a dog or a muffin? I mean, this is a very easy task for us and we can solve it in, you know, milliseconds effortlessly without thinking about it, but it's actually a very difficult machine learning or intelligence problem. And the difficulty of this problem is known as Moravec's paradox, which says that things that are easy for us, like walking, perceiving the world, uh, smelling, hearing, are very hard for machines. And things that are apparently very difficult for us, like playing here go or playing chess or, you know, even solving differential equations, we can now train machines that are as good than us. And there is not, uh, you know, there are some conjectures of how, why this is the case. It may have to be to do to the fact that our brains had millions of years of time to evolve to give rise to, for example, uh, in, in visual systems with incredible capabilities, i.e. make us visual geniuses. Whereas other things like uh, playing Go, for example, is not, there was not the evolutionary um, you know, demands for our brains to perfect those skills. And it, it, you know, the, the, our ability, the fact that computers can be trained to solve game go much better than computer vision is a testament to the difficulty and the high level of intelligence at the same time that our brains have evolved to do. And what we're interested to understand, one of the kind of hallmarks in, in neuroscience is to try to understand how brain computes information and gives rise to these capabilities, in this case, perceptual or visual inference. The goal is to basically, you get these pixel intensities 
you know, on your retina and you have to infer the causes. In this case, it's a muffin or a dog. Now at the heart of trying to understand this problem lies in understanding representations. And what I mean by representations is how individual neurons and populations of neurons encode information in, 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 that falls on the retina. And you know, there's many pioneers and heroes in this field, and one of them is Hardline, who, who in the you know in the 40s did very seminal experiments and discovered that neurons, individual ganglion cells in the retina had receptive fields. And he used these dots or little lines to map the receptive field of neurons. And subsequently, uh, Hubel and Weasel uh, did this, and I will play a movie, did this uh, seminal discovery of uh, figuring out that individual neurons in the brain are tuned to the orientation of edges or bar. But Many of these discoveries, and in particular, there's a very nice documentary here describing how Hubel and Weasel discovered the edge detector, so to speak, happened by serendipity. And I will play a few seconds clip of David describing how he did these experiments. The black dot seemed to be working in a way that at first we couldn't understand until we found that it was the process of slipping the piece of glass into the projector, which swept a line, a very faint, precise, narrow line across the retina. And every time we did that, we'd get a response. So basically what Hubel is saying here, you know, they use these dots to try and drive neurons. They couldn't drive them. And one day, reliable responses, but they couldn't figure out the relationship between this dot and a, pot, a potential or a receptive field. And then they realized that there was this edge that you can see here at the edge of the monitor, I'm, I'm pointing it here, moving it up and down, that was actually driving the neurons. So they did not create these large contrast edges to map receptive fields that were using dots because Hardline was using dots. And, and this is one of the great examples. You know, there's many more stories. Um, this is work done by John O'Keefe and Moser, who again won Nobel Prizes. And again, you know, they were not looking necessarily for grid cells. You know, they had the animal run around in a big enough arena, and then they discovered uh, this beautiful organization of grid cells and place fields. Now the problem, and, and in particularly in the visual system, uh, stems from the fact that the dimensionality of the input is very big, and there's a nonlinear relationship between this input space and the responses of neurons, okay? And it's very hard to, study this high dimensional space. If you have, for example, a monitor that is black and white, that means pixels are either on or off and you have 100 by 100 pixels, you generate in the, you know, two to the 10,000 patterns on the monitor. This is more than the number of electrons in the whole universe, so it's a difficult problem. And it's been difficult over decades to try and do uh, systematically characterize the tuning functions of the response selectivity of neurons in trying to understand how formation is represented and propagated through the visual cortex, for example, to understand intelligence and the computations that lead rise to this kind of, um, you know, to mechanistically dissect how we can distinguish the dog from the mouse. And, you know, there is a lot of progress, specifically work done in frontemporal cortex by many people in, in the recent years, but also going back to work done in the 70s by Charlie Gross, but it's still a very a challenging problem. Now, what I would describe to you today is a method that we developed that is called inception loops that we think is promising to try and solve this decades old problem. And what I will describe to you the data today, this is published data coming from a photon image mice, but very similar methods. We're using them using, in fact, neural nexus probes in macaques and you can apply them to even EEG data in humans or uh, maybe even fMRI data. I mean, but we've definitely, you know, we've used them both with two photon imaging and electrophysiological cortex. But I'll just present it to photon data, which is, uh, uh, you know, published data and it also describes the details of the methodology. So the inception loop, the goal of the inception loop is to build an in silico avatar of the visual cortex and try and 
systematically decipher the representation. So in a way like rely less on serendipity and more on systematic approach on how one would go about mapping this high dimensional space to the responses. And this is work that was led by Ed uh, Walker and uh, Fabian Sin um, in my lab and, um, and, 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 and many other people that are on the paper. And there's also uh, related work using with the same concept, but using different methodology by Jim DiCarlo's lab and Livingstone and Kreeman that, and they're actually in macaque physiology of studies. So it just shows you that these type of ideas have, can have wide impact across many species and techniques. So in our case, the inception time has four main uh, steps. The first step is to do a large scale recording where you record from many, many neurons uh, from the chunk of the brain that you want to do system identification or characterize. In our case, as I said, you know, we show 5,000 images and we're recording the order of five to 10,000 neurons, okay? And we record them in a dense chunk of, uh, you know, in, in a small chunk of the cortex. In this case, it's primary visual cortex of the mouse, of an awake behaving mouse, that is on a treadmill and is running around um, during the presentation. So the second step is once you get all this data, you want to build a predictive model whose goal is to learn how to respond to, the, you know, is to try and predict the responses of one of the, every one of these five to 10,000 neurons to an arbitrary natural image, to an image that you have never seen before, the model has never seen before. So in this case, let's say we've never used this particular dog to train the model. The first time we show this, uh, we, we showed this model to the animal, we got the responses. The model is trying to match the responses. And to do this, we use deep learning. You know, deep learning is the best, let's say, statistical tool or model building tool to build predictive models. It's revolutionized many fields and industries in the last 10 years. And, and it works extremely well when you have a large amount of data. And here, because of the way we build the model, if we have 5,000 neurons, we have, you know, uh, 5,000 images, we get 25 million training data points to train this model end to end. So we have a lot of data, and this is in par with, let's say, data that, you know, benchmarks that people use in deep learning or Google uses to train, let's say, a voice recognition system or a system that recognizes images when you do a search. So the goal here, and this is the step number two, is to build a model that is going to match the brain, uh, you know, the responses of the brain to any arbitrary natural image. So these are well matched. Now there's many different components in the model. I just want to bring a few. One, it has this common core, what we call a core. And the concept here is that if you're recording from the, let's say, layer two, three pyramidal cells in layer B, in B1, mouse, and this is what the data I will show you today come from, and you record 10,000 10, neurons, you use all of the neurons and all of the images to train this common core. And then each one of these neurons has its own readout from a common feature map. So you learn this function, this nonlinear function from pixels to responses going through two steps if you want. I mean, it's train and trend, but you can conceptualize it like that. The first step is you learn the nonlinear feature embedding from pixels this feature activation, and then you have a dedicated linear readout with the output nonlinearity to predict each one of the individual neurons. And again, the idea here is that these neurons are not, you know, doing completely different things. They're all, first of all, visual. They all come from the same part of uh, the visual cortex. We know that they have similar size receptive fields. And from previous work, including the pioneering work of David Kubel and many, many others, you know, there's like thousands of papers on these neurons that are in the same chunk of the visual cortex are doing similar computations. And, and these type of models that they share a common core as opposed to models that build dedicated models for each one of these neurons are much more powerful and they are current state of the art. So this is the current state of the art in building a model to predict the responses to an arbitrary natural image. Then there is some other uh, accessories if you want to this model. These are mice. Mice cannot be trained to fixate. They will move their eyes every now and then. So we have what we call motor output or brain state, behavioral state, uh, like the pupil diameter, which is an indication of 
how much attention the animal is paying, and also the running, things that we know modulate the responses in addition to the visual input. So you can think of this as extra retina modulatory signals that you can also put into the model. It could be, you know, if you train an animal, it could be that the animal is making. It could be, as I said, the pupil moving the eyes will shift the receptive fields. This model can be trained end to end to learn all this stuff together. And as I said, these models are current state of the art. Here is a linear model. Okay, in mouse V1, unlike the monkey, a lot of these neurons have a strong linear component. You can think of the more, as, more simple cell like than complex cell like, but they still have a, a respectable non-linearity that you can extract from these models. And here on LN is the linear version of this model and CNN is the non-linear version. And you can see that on average, these models extract in the order of 75 to 80 percent of the fraction of Oracle. This is of the, you know, there are different ways to, to, to quantify what is the maximal, if you had, if you were actually recording from the brain, if you were to replicate the brain 100%, what is the maximum uh, predictability you could achieve? And the reason that you cannot go at 100% is that there is noise in the brain. You know, there is trial to trial variability that is yet to be understood. We don't fully understand how to model that, and we can only model the visual component. Okay. Uh, so, and, and sorry, I said this wrong actually. You can reach in this particular case 100% because it factors out this noise. But the reason that your test correlations are not perfect, they're not at one here on the x axis. Uh, on this figure, I don't know if you see my uh, my pointer is because of the noise. So once we do this, we take a subset of these neurons. Now, for for the experiments I would describe, you know, so right now we collected the data, we built this model, and the step number three is to analyze this model, and we can analyze this model for all five thousand neurons. And we analyze the data, and I'll show you how what I mean by that. So. The deep neural networks are not an entirely a black box. People think, oh, you know, this is a black box, but this is not quite true. You can, for example, if you think about it, if you have a good model, an avatar of a neuron that you want to study or, or, or these 5,000 neurons, you can run it on a GPU or use a supercomputer to run an unlimited number of experiments, essentially, other than energy constraints that would have been virtually impossible to run were to record throughout the lifetime of this animal or even your own lifetime or many times your lifetime because you can parallelize it and you can run every experiment that has ever been run in neuroscience or you, you can do whatever you want. But you can actually do something even much more intelligent than that. What you can do, and I will show you one of these experiments, is you can find the optimal stimulus in the network for every one of these neurons. And the way you do it, because this is a neural network, and it's a differentiable model, you can use differentiation, like essentially what Newton discovered, to find, to optimize the stimulus with respect to the activity of a specific neuron. So I will show you a schematic here. You start from an image, it's a white noise image, you show it to the, to the, to the model, and you get some target neurons activity. And now you compute the gradient, basically what you want to find out is how should I change the image in the image space, in this pixel space, so then I can increase the activity of these neurons. And this is, it's the equivalent of, you know, you use back propagation to do this. In this case, you do gradient ascent, but instead of the way you normally use it, which is to train the synapses of this network, when you're training the network, now you use it to back propagate the gradient, but the only thing you change is the input layer, okay? And here is a, a, an example. You, Forward, you get some activity, go back and forth, and now you change, you compute the gradient, and you change the stimulus, and this is actually a real prediction for a, a, a real neuron, whose this is the model's neuron, that it looks like an edge detector. So in a way, by doing this more systematic approach, we sort of reinvented the wheel, if you want, where we discovered that this neuron, you know, would make uh, David uh, Hubel and Thorsten Weasel very happy because it does this edge-like detector appearance. So it predicts that the optimal stimulus for this neuron would be this particular edge in this location and this size. 
But when we looked at many neurons in mouse B1, and you know, as I said, you can get 5,000 neurons and you can look at all of them. You can run this in all the neurons. A lot of them did not look like your, what you would think as an edge detector or a classical Gabor filter. Instead, they had uh, interesting structure that when my daughter saw when we were writing the paper, she thought it reminded her of a Chihuahua. Now, I don't think these are Chihuahua detectors, but they're definitely not, they don't have simple uh, features or simple uh, texture, if you want, that what you would expect from a Gabor-like filter. And here is 150 of them. Uh, these are the 150 that we got uh, based on the models. You know, we had excellent model predictions for these neurons. But if you look at all the other ones, that even if the ones that we didn't have the best prediction, they all look, you know, the ones that don't look like clean and crisp like this, they, the, that's the ones that we didn't have a good model prediction. But the ones that we have a good model prediction, they look this very, you know, nice appearance where they're localized in a receptive field. And if I go through a few of them, you will see that some of them do look like uh, Gabor-like filters or gratings, but a lot of them look like checkerboards of different orientations. Some look like sharp corners and different, of different angles, and some look like corners on a black background or white corners on a black background or uh, black corners on a white background. And some of them look more like curved strokes and, and so on. Now, this is a nonlinear optimization method. And the reason that people in the 80s were very skeptical that neural networks would be a decent solution, maybe not the ultimate solution, but even a decent solution to solving, let's say, machine learning problems, was this idea that if they will find a local minima, you know, that the input space dimensionality is so large that you'll never have enough training points. And this comes from classical thinking and statistics. And what was surprising once computer became larger and we had in the order of millions of images to train these networks, they started working. And people, you know, in the last, I would say, few years, people are starting to understand why that is the case and why this local minimum may not be as a serious problem as people have thought. But it's always good to do a sanity check on this. And here is evidence we don't seem to have this problem and you can do a very simple experiment you can start your optimization from a different point in the input space so here is two white noise patterns and two natural images and as you can see for every one of these six neurons the solution is the same so it doesn't matter what part of the input space you start you end up finding the same solution so I'm not saying this is a global solution but it's a stable solution which is an indication that you have some aspect of a, a it, may, it may be very close to a global solution too. And this is like an empirical finding that also, you know, machine learning people that don't work in neuroscience, you know, repeatedly make the same observation. You have enough training data and you apply enough of regularization. Now there are technical issues of, you know, it has to do with the model bias and the inductive bias in these networks and how you regular and how you smooth this function during the optimization to make them look like that, but you can create them so they're stable. And, and this is necessary because if they were not stable, it's not sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition to start believing that maybe this means something. Now that, since we're doing chronic imaging, now this, despite, you know, running this on a very large uh, computer, you know, cluster, a GPU cluster, it takes time to feed this model and then optimize all these neurons. Okay, so it can take many, many hours overnight, basically. So in day one, we record the data, you know, for a couple of hours, then we run it through the pre-processing pipeline, then we build this model, then we optimize it overnight. And the next day now, we have these most exciting inputs, guys, that now we are ready to show back to the neurons. And since we're doing chronic imaging, we can go and find exactly the neurons that we want to study. In this case, it shows you a bunch of these neurons, I think like 15 of these neurons that we may want to go and study. The other thing is that this MEI is the most exciting inputs are stable over days. Like if you repeat the same, you know, it could be the case that the plasticity is so strong in the brain that every day, every night V1 like reorganizes its spatial temporal filters or its uh, tuning functions and then, you know, they're not stable. 
So here we show that these are stable over days. That means that plasticity is not so strong that we don't have to close the loop within an hour, but we can close it within days. And this is within 24 hours. Okay, so now we take these 150 images and we show them back to the brain. And here is what we call the confusion. These are the real responses now from the brain, from these 150 neurons, when we showed them these uh, 150 MEIs. And each row here is the responses of one neuron to different MEIs. And the MEIs are ordered according to what we predict should be the optimal steam MEI for that specific neuron. So for example, if you take neuron 13, the 13th MEI is its own MEI. And the fact that you get this strong diagram here says two things. One is that the model is predicting out of this, you know, the right op stimulus that drives it more than all the other stimuli in the data set. And the fact that it looks sparse, this matrix, other than the diagonal, shows you that these neurons are very selective within this database or in this dictionary of these 150 MEIs. So they're very tuned, they're sharply tuned, because if they were detuned, and let's say they may like the MEI that we showed it the best, but they also like to 90% every other MEI, then the, you know, even if there was a, the diagonal would be stronger, you would get much more background pixels lighting up. Okay, so in V1, and this is important, in the mouse, there's a sparse representation at this level of sparseness of how they represent, how they are tuned in this MEI manifold. If you will. Another thing we can do to show how good these models are, we can take a, a row here and we can prod the predicted response for a specific neurons against the observed response. And you see that you get a very tight correlation. And you see here the population across married neurons that is in the order of 85.85 correlation coefficient, which is very high, which it tells you that the, the model is not just predicting the optimal MEI, but it's predicting how these neurons would fire to this manifold over MEIs. And now we can use this also to analyze this further. Now, we, as I said, we also have a linear model. So we compare the linear model to the uh, nonlinear model. You see this difference in the spatial frequencies. You know, so there, there's some similarity between them, but you see that the, um, the MEIs have higher spatial frequencies and more rich structures. So as I told you earlier, mouse V1, layer two, three, with a strong linear component in their responses, but the nonlinearity is strong enough that it gives you this. However, it could be the case that we have not learned anything interesting until now other than the linear model, right? Because you know, it may be that the confusion matrix, the reason that we get this very strong diagonal, some of it must be attributed to the linear model. And the question is, are we predicting something beyond the linear component? And here is a quantification of the power spectrum comparing the, the MEIs to the receptive fields. And you see that there's higher spatial frequencies in these MEIs. And in this plot here, what you see is the fact that the, the, MEI, the, 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 the MEI drives the real neurons stronger, much significantly stronger, as you can see here, in most of these neurons than the linear receptive field, okay? So here it tells you that these higher spatial frequency or more rich structure, like you see maybe something that looks like from MEI, it looks like a the receptive field of like an edge detector and the other one looks more like a corner. It's real, like it actually is predictive of firing the neuron higher than before. Okay. So now we can ask the following question, what is that these MEIs mean? Okay, now if you look at, you know, the, the, the goal in neuroscience is not just to sort of describe the system, but try and understand it in a normative way. That's kind of the ultimate goal of any science, I guess, right? You have to make a description and then in neuroscience, because it has a lot of influence also from fields, more mature fields than biology like physics, we have this, you know, wish if you want or goal to try and build a normative model to explain the responses. And the, one of the celebrated um, cases is the old cousin and field, you know, seminal paper from the 90s where they used a normative approach based on ideas from Barlow and others to build 
a sparse model where the idea is that if we want a sparse dictionary or features that will represent natural image statistics and they got these very nicely looking Gabor filters okay and that was you could think about it if this was done before the experiments of Hubel and Weasel just a normative approach of studying natural image statistics and this idea of sparse uh, or, or redundancy you know and sparseness you could give rise to uh, a prediction that then could have been tested experimentally or it was verified they came up with a model to explain these results but if you look at the mouse this doesn't seem to be the case the sparse coding model at least this version of it with this level of sparseness does not seem to explain uh, this data very well so and we're trying to understand you know is there analogous uh, uh, sparse or a uh, you know, a normative model, maybe putting in different constraints or different levels of these constraints that would give rise to this type of representation that one sees in the mouse. And to do that, what Edgar and Fabian did, you know, to start investigating this, they did the following experiment. They took the model and they passed a new set of 5,000 images, natural images, cropped at the size of the receptive field and located at the size of the receptive field of each one of these 5,000 neurons, okay? So you take a new set of 5,000 images, you pass them through the model, and you ask, what is the most exciting natural image patch? Okay, the question here was that these textures that we see, that are the MEIs, the most exciting inputs to these neurons, do they, uh, do, do they have any, you know, can we understand anything about them in the way they could resemble features in natural scenes? So here is a most exciting input to one neuron. It looks like a corner, a white corner on a black background. And here is the best natural image. You see, it's, it's the natural image is cropped to be approximately at the size of the, to correspond to the size of the receptive field of the MEI, and also at located at the same location. And the, if you look at the whole image, it was part of, it was the corner of, of the window at the back window of this minibus. So here is a bunch of them. Here is the MEI on the left, the, max, the maximum natural image cropped and the full field. And here you see something that looks like a dot with a bar. Here it looks like this tri-lobe <coughs> texture. Here is the one I showed you before. Here is an image that has an acute angle. Here is one that looks like a checkerboard. Here is one that has like this very sharp crescent-like structure that is almost closed with a little white dot, you know. So, and, and you can go on a, a T-junction and so on and so forth. So what the bottom line here is that these most exciting inputs, if you search through natural images, you find natural image patches that uh, seem to be activating these neurons. And what uh, we, uh, uh, we quantified this effect, and this was uh, uh, done by Eric Kobos, who was also uh, one of the main contributors to this. And, 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 and what uh, we did here is that we plotted the, the masked, you know, we wanted to look at the sparsity or the distribution of how these neurons fire to these 5,000 natural images. And each one of the gray lines is the normalized, is the distribution of activations and they are ordered, uh, normalized to the MEI. So, and what you see that on average, if you look at, let's say this new, or let's look at this neuron here, that is the red one. What you see is that most of the images drive the responses very low. As you can see, you know, if I drop, let's say to, um, you know, in the order of, let's say, you know, 25% of the activation, very few of these neurons drive it below 25% of the activation, you know. But now a few of them, very few, and that's why you see this heavy tail or this very kurtotic distribution, they drive it high, okay. And to give you some numbers here, about one in 2,000 images produce activations above 75% of the MEI. Typically, the MEI is always the best because that's the one that was optimized. But I would say that if you take any neuron on average, you find about one in 2,000 natural image passes, pa patches that drive it 75% or more, which is, gives you the level of sparseness 
that these uh, uh, that these neurons are tuned to in natural image statistics. Okay. Now the other thing, and this is work done uh, uh, by uh, uh, Alex Ecker, who now has his own lab in Göttingen, and we're collaborating on this project. And Ivan, uh, his student, is that what what they did is that they, they looked at these MEIs and they said, you know, these things look to be clustered into functional types. Potentially, this, you know, one of the big issues in neuroscience is to understand cell types. You know, we know, for example, the inhibitory cells are organized into cell types. People have some evidence that maybe neurons, excitatory neurons may have different functional properties. Again, we don't know all this stuff. Here is a way that we can systematically approach this. And, and you can read the, the papers here. They're an iClear paper, a machine learning paper by Ivan. Um, and also uh, Alex has a paper on archive on this. And also this is in collaboration with Matthias Betke's lab in Tübingen. So here what we find is that these neurons, these MEIs and their tuning functions seem to be clustered into functional cell types. The way we define this functional cell type um, is that these neurons have similar tuning functions, including the MEI, up to translation and rotation. So if, for example, I zoom in one of these things here, here is a block we just, you know, it's, it's neurons that are adjacent to each other in terms of their tuning function, other than they're in different locations in space, as you see here, and they're rotated versions of each other. So it's like this comb-like structure with a, a white background that we've seen as one type. And these are 16 different neurons that seem to have the same tuning function, same MEI, other than translation and rotation. So, you know, this method, as I said, you know, it has a lot of capabilities. You can now extend it. Here is another one. They look this very cool looking eye-like structures. And again, with this sort of wide, uh, wide ring with a black intercept around it, one or two black intercepts. And you see that again, they're in different locations and rotated versions of each other. Okay, so to summarize so far, we have a method that we can record the activity from the brain. We, we, these are the four steps that I went through. You model the activity with deep learning, you optimize in silico in the avatar, you make predictions. You can run any experiment you want. You can run your favorite experiment in silico I don't know, show like a billion different images. If you are rich enough and you buy enough GPU power, then you find interesting stimuli or you do an interesting analysis. In the particular case, we use gradient-based methods to find optimal stimuli. And then you can, if you have chronic recordings, you can record them back in the brain. And as I said, we're doing very similar experiments with neural nexus technology in monkeys right now. And with some very promising results, where we get very nice single cell resolution and we get laminar recordings. So this method is flexible, verifiable description of nonlinear representations. This is the way. What I'm particularly excited about it is that this method can be applied beyond even neuroscience, but even within neuroscience, you can study all these pieces without even knowing what the computational goal of the system is. As long as you drive the system and you do measurement, then you can analyze it in silico and then come and test it back. So this has a lot of different applications and you can use it to solve many hard optimizations problem, as I said, not just in neuroscience, but in engineering in general. Now, for the last part of the talk, which is, you know, I've been trying to finish up, I want to ask the question, what does it mean to understand the brain? So if the brain was this um, toaster here and we wanted to understand it, then one approach would be to build a structurally faithful model, more like an anatomical model of the toaster, where we would replicate the different component parts structurally and how they are assembled together. And there is some functionality, you know, you move the, the toaster's things up and down, what is equivalent to the slice bridge moves up and down, but with this approach alone, we're not going to get a rich understanding of the function of the toaster. The other approach is what I described so far, which I call the iron board approach, which is essentially you build, you do, you know, I went through this talk and I described this 
system identification point of view that was agnostic to the circuit. These deep learning models have nothing to do, very little to do with the way the actual brain implements the computation. You're just trying to like study, learn this function as a parameterization of what the brain is doing. So you're trying to learn this function that goes from uh, pixels to responses. And here it would be equivalent to having an iron board and you're making toes. So in the, from a functional point of view, you are still making toes. And I can claim that they taste even better than the original toaster. You can also do other things like melt cheese on it. But if the toaster were to break down, then you'll have a hard time fixing the toaster. And because in neuroscience, we're not just interested to just understand the computation or the algorithm of the brain. We understand that the implementation level or more the anatomical and the molecular level so that when it breaks down in disease, we can go and fix it, okay? The mission of NIH is this, is not just to understand the computation, but to be able to fix it. And there is you know, neuropsychiatric diseases is sort of the rising, um, you know, problem in society these days as, as the population ages. And to do this, there are other, you know, we, we follow this sort of hierarchical direction in my lab. And I will go through it very briefly. And we have a bunch of papers on it. Read is that in order to understand this at the implementation level and go beyond just the algorithmic level, we need to define the component parts, the cell types that comprise brain circuits at the molecular level, the physiological level, morphological level. And to do this, we develop a method called patch seek that you can read about it. We have a paper coming out soon in nature that describes more, uh, the, you know, how we use this method to study cell types as part of the BICCN consortium of an NIH brain initiative. Then you have to define the wiring diagram of the circuit. And then you have to link computation and function, which is I've been discussing so far, and bring these things together. So you have to bring, if you want the iron board approach of the toaster and the wooden approach to the toaster together, you have to link structure and function together and the wiring and the cell types to try understand how a model or how the brain gives rise to these nonlinear representations, computer these MEIs. A sort of schematic way of thinking about it is like the Hubel and Weasel model of how you go from the LGN center surround organization to oriented selective cell. That's a very sort of classical model because the wiring model, if you want, it's a model that tries to explain not just what are the representations, but how they arise. Okay. And to do this, um, what we did, and this was work uh, led by uh, Xialong Zhang when he was in my lab. What Xialong did is that he did a very heroic effort where he used patching, multi patching, a system, electrophysiological setup, where he would patch it neurons simultaneously, fill them in, and study their connectivity. And, uh, and, and here is uh, one of these experiments. He, he would page neurons simultaneously, stimulate one at a time, compute this eight by eight connectivity matrix, reconstruct the neurons. And here is some other papers um, from other uh, in my lab that did a similar approach to study different parts of the brain. And out of this heroic effort, Xialong collected 11,000 pairs of neurons and each one of these neurons he would categorize morphologically its cell type. And this was mainly focused on layer one, layer two, three, layer four, and layer five of, um, oh, sorry, not layer four, four, but layer, layer one, layer one, layer two, three, and layer five of mouse visual cortex. We have another paper on layer four. And in, in this case, he would, this is the wiring diagram. And if you look at this wiring diagram, it looks like, you know, I don't know, a subway system, and you don't get a lot of understanding. So it looks beautiful aesthetically, but what is it that we understand from it? And understanding means distilling it down to principles and rules of what these are. So what I will show you next is that this seemingly complex wiring diagram, we can, you know, in, in, a, in a literally like 30 seconds, will tell you three rules that you can reconstruct it without having to remember all these details. And before I do that, I will show you this plotted as a connectivity matrix uh, called the Hinton plot, where basically here is this uh, it, it different interneurons and layer two, three, and layer five pyramidal neurons. And for those who are familiar, there's neuroglia from cells, Martinotti cells, basket cells, 
uh, chanteliers and so on and so forth. And what you see is that this connectivity has some structure. It has these vertical stripes, and then it has this diagonal structure. And from these, uh, what we came up with these three rules that to a certain extent can reconstruct this circuit. And here is the first rule. The first rule is that there's a very special type of neuron in the brain called the Martinotti cell, which is a master regulator. And it follows the same connectivity property. A Martinotti cell will connect to all other neurons, both interneurons and pyramidal cells in its vicinity. But two Martinotti cells will never connect to each other, okay? The second rule is most of these PV-like interneurons like basket cells, Chantelier cells, uh, some other categories that uh, see along uh, defined that look different like sharp cells and so on and the rules that these neurons follow is that they will only connect with a, 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 to inhibitory neurons of their same type for example basket cells will connect to basket cells primarily and sharp cells or horizontally elongated cells in their five horizontally elongated cells and they will also be reciprocally connected to pyramidal cells so, uh, as will the Martinotti cells. So in some ways, the Martinotti cells, you can think of this as the opposite of these basket cells, which are basket-like cells or different versions of basket cells that are PV positive. They will connect to each their own, but the Martinot, but not to any other internals, where the Martinotti connects to everybody else but its own type. Okay, and that's why we must regulate. And the third rule is that in each one of these layers, there is a cell type that doesn't seem to be integrated into the circuit. It doesn't receive local input from the circuit, and we think this could be controlled by modulatory signals or other subcortical systems, or maybe feedback. Now, when you take what Fabian Sin did when he was in my lab, uh, who is a computational neuroscientist, machine learning scientist, he took these three rules and built a likelihood model, a model just based on these three rules and uh, layers, of course. And if you look at the data and the model, they look very, very similar. It captures these vertical stripes. I mean, it basically captures these vertical stripes that you see, and it captures this sort of diagonal organization. But of course, it misses a lot of details, but the bottom line is that there is, we believe there are simple connectivity motifs or rules that we can describe the structure of the circuit. Now, but ultimately we want to bring and function together. And to do this, we have a, a program that, um, is funded by Microns uh, through IARBA. This is in collaboration with Nuna Takosta and Clary at the Allen Institute, Sebastian Sang, and in my lab, the people uh, that were the pioneers in this was Jake Rimmer, who has now his own lab at Baylor College of Medicine, Paul Fahey, who is an MD PhD student, and Manuel Frudaragis, who now has his own lab in beautiful Crete. So what you know, what we hear is that we wanted to create the this is the largest data set that combines connectomics data, EM data with functional data. Here is a millimeter cube. We imaged a bunch of mice, a millimeter cube each one of these mice spanning four visual areas. And then the mice were sent to the Allen Institute where Nuno Tacosta and Clay Reed's uh, team, you know, collected, uh, did a heroic effort, really toured the force using a number of these EM machines, running them 24 seven for many months. You know, it, it took this project years to complete to basically get high resolution at the nano scale of every single uh, voxel in this one millimeter cube. And then Sebastian Sang's team did an incredible uh, job in trying to build using 3D convolutional neural networks and other machine learning methods to reconstruct the connectome of the circuit, right? To basically segment this data. So then we would have the function, the, the structure, the morphology of these cells, and the connections. Just to give you the, the scale of the data, we recorded about seven, not about, we recorded seven mice, about 700,000 neurons, in total 100,000 neurons per mouse. Each mouse has about a billion synapses. And, uh, and, and, and one of these mice went through the complete pipeline. We imaged seven mice, but it was a winner mice, and then there's a second one now at the smaller scale that has also neurons that is going through the pipeline. Now, this mouse that uh, we are right now in the process of analyzing with the Allen's team, Allen Institute team, and the uh, Princeton team, uh, it involves areas V1, RL, AL, and LM. So it's an, and the reason that we put 
The volume there is because we're not just interested to study local circuitry, but we're particularly interested in these recurrent connections between areas. Okay, here is like a visualization of this data. These are the real data of, uh, I think here is like 70,000 or maybe 30,000 of these neurons. And this was rendered by James Cotton, who is now is a professor at, uh, in Chicago and, um, and used to be in my lab. And you can see that these neurons are like flickering on and off as they're firing calcium spikes. And now we have a functional character of the methods I described you earlier, where we've applied these methods to characterize every one of the single neurons that we got good signal to noise in this data set. And as I said, you know, this mouse uh, was shipped to the Allen Institute. And here is like a one visualization. This is very early days, uh, a few months ago now, almost a year ago when we did this, we have much more richer data to show soon. And here is that we're starting to basically map structure and function. Here's one neuron with this postsynaptic target. And now we can go and match the EM data to the functional data and find the relationship. And with this, I would like to close and thank my collaborators, Jake Remier, who has done an incredible job, job leading the, you know, the functional imaging part of the project when he was in my lab. And as I said, now he's at, he has his own lab. And also uh, my very, very close uh, computational neuroscience and, and collaborators, Zach Pitko, who is being a theoretician in the team, uh, Alex Ecker, and Fabian Sind, Alex now has moved to Gettingen where he's a professor there and also the Max Planck Institute there. And Matthias Betge, who has been my collaborator in machine learning and AI and computational neuroscience for many years. Um, he, and the electron microscopy work, as I said, was Clay Reed, Nuno Tacosta and the reconstruction by Sebastian Sand. And also uh, Philip Burns here, uh, who I didn't show the work, but we've been collaborating on the functional cell type and on the cell types, both on the multi-patching and the patch seek that I didn't show today. And I would like to thank the people that did my lab that did the work. Uh, first, you know, most of the data I presented today was from Edgar Walker and Fabian Sin, who now is a faculty in Tubigen. And Talia Mohammad did all the recording. She done an incredible job. And also Eric Kobos, who just now started his PhD when he was in my lab as a research scientist did a lot of the machine learning work. So I said, Jake Ramier, Paul Fahey, Brendan Kelly, Christos Papadopoulos, Manolis Fudaragis, James Cotton, uh, Christos Papadopoulos, Telios Papadopoulos, and Jiwei Ding worked on the, are currently working on the EM data. This is a very collaborative project. It involves actually Eric Wang here too, a lot of other people, um, because this data is like incredibly rich. And the first, we did a pilot study we call the golden mouse, what I described was the Platinum mouse, these data is already publicly available online and anybody can download them and analyze them. Thank you very much. And of course, our funding agents. Yeah, thanks, Andreas. That was very interesting. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's great to learn more about your methods and techniques, uh, which are clearly at the leading edge of computational neuroscience and, and EFIS uh, data collection and analysis. So Appreciate uh, you going through those slides. Again, thank you, Dr. Tullius, for this presentation and taking time out of your busy schedule. I'd like to thank all the attendees uh, for your participation and stay tuned for future webinars. There's uh, one scheduled for September 3rd and more information will be coming out on that uh, soon. So again, thanks everyone and uh, stay healthy out there. Have thank a good day. You. Bye.